It's a uh, great pleasure to appear before the City Club. Join us, ask questions, and talk to the people who make New York what it is. A New York City tradition. Welcome. I'm Mindy Stern, president of the City Club of New York. The City Club is a 100-plus-year-old good government organization. Its mission is to oversee the operation of New York City's government to ensure that it's efficient, effective, and responsive to the citizens of our city. We carry out the club's mission through a variety of education and advocacy programs. One of our educational programs is the public policy forum that you're watching today. As a nonpartisan organization, we consider it our responsibility to inform you, the public, about the critical issues of the day confronting our city. We also know that if we want New York City to remain a vibrant place to live and work, that we need to develop tomorrow's leaders from today's students. To assist in that effort, we invite students from local high schools to attend the City Club's forums so that they can learn more about the city's civic life. By involving students in these forums, we also hope to encourage them to become active participants in civic life. It's my pleasure to in introduce our student guest today, and I ask him to stand, Grant Stansberry, from, uh, who's a senior at Manhattan Center High School. Welcome. Our topic today is the revitalization of Harlem. As you know, a number of city neighborhoods have for years stubbornly resisted, call it what you will, gentrification, revitalization, redevelopment, even during times that are supposedly prosperous for the city. Until relatively recently, Harlem was one of those communities. But that has started to change, first slowly, then more recently by leaps and bounds. Of course, those who have the vision and the courage to take on the revitalization of a neighborhood uh, with some sort of overall plan in mind have a responsibility to not to do it at the expense of the people who are already there. Joining us today is Karen Phillips of the Abyssinian Development Corporation, who's one of those visionaries. And to introduce her, please join me in welcoming Elton Massey, one of the members of the City Club's Housing Committee. Elton. Good afternoon. I have the pleasure to present a woman who is a visionary, who is leading a revival of a once and will be great neighborhood. She was born in Georgia. She attended the University of Georgia. Then she moved on to Harvard, where she received a master's in urban development from the Kennedy School. After graduation, she came to New York, the Mecca, and went straight north to Harlem, where she founded and became CEO of the Abyssinian Development Corporation. Everyone, I'd like to have a round of applause to present Ms. Karen Phillips. Thank you, Elton. I was appalled when I realized that they actually gave out my bio here, but uh, the important things that he said is that uh, I am from Georgia originally. I keep my southern roots, but uh, I'm very happy to be uh, in working in New York City and particularly in Harlem, which as many of you know and, and more and more people don't know, was once the cultural capital of the world for people of African descent. So for me, I suppose it is Mecca. Uh, I'm delighted to be speaking today to um, this organization. Uh, when I was asked, I asked you know, a number of questions, but just thinking, um, you know, um, what if people read about Harlem and what is it that they really want to, me to say? And of course, uh, as some people have said, there's something usually uh, controversial about uh, what I say, but more importantly, I think if people hear more of the good news about Harlem, uh, they can assist all of us in the rebuilding there. I will, I've been told, uh, you know, of the format here, and uh, I'm very happy that everybody's had lunch. I'm hoping you have some of that chocolate cake for me. But I will say that after watching the speech last night, if we don't have too many standing ovations, that I'm sure I'll be able to get through my speech much faster. So if you don't mind, thank you very much. Um, 
And uh, the revitalization of Harlem is something that uh, sometimes I feel like we are uh, thought of as, as Native Americans looked at Christopher Columbus, that people right all of a sudden are saying, wow, Harlem has happened, or it's, you know, all of a sudden, all these miraculous things have happened. But I'd like to, in this, which I will call the State of Harlem Address for today, give you a little bit first of uh, a little history, I'll make it brief, and then to talk a little bit about um, Abyssinian Development Corporation. Uh, then I would like to talk about some of the opportunities, because I think a lot of people come to to hear about, you know, what's the new hot thing and how do I get uh, part of this new wave. Also, sometimes some part to um, the downsides. Uh, I heard the word gentrification, one that I just say to my staff, we don't use in our vocabulary here. Um, and to dispel some of the rumors. Um, and then to uh, hopefully be sh um, short in my remarks so that we can open it up from some questions and um, actually engage in some dialogue because I think that's one of the things that's missing often is that people uh, see what they read in the, in the paper and, and it, it gives them one picture of it. I'm um, often, I guess, asked to comment or, or quotes and often those don't always come out the way that I intend them to. Uh, but I'm always so thrilled when people have positive things to say about the community in which I live and work. And uh, there was a time when we would try to open new projects and I'd call up the, the press and say, uh, you know, we're doing this great thing, will you come? And they said, oh, that's not something we want to cover. And I said, well, someone will miraculously be stabbed on the steps of the building that we're going to open, so maybe you'll cover it then. <laughs> As I mentioned, uh, the 20s and 30s in Harlem was a great time of the Harlem Renaissance, and people now say we're experiencing the new Harlem Renaissance. And when I try to explain or figure out why this particular neighborhood was the home of such wonderful, uh, great writers and uh, performers and artists and, and being in this uh, uh, place reminds me of that. Um, I think about my upbringing in a very small town in South Georgia when people say where is it, it's 200 miles from Atlanta as we stay down south smack dab in the middle of nowhere. But growing up there, um, there uh, the landscape or the environment there was relatively bleak for people of African descent. And a lot of those people migrated north. And when I think about the people who came to this neighborhood, w either having lived in small tenements down in lower Manhattan or uh, the west side of Manhattan, or people who came from those small towns of dirt streets and wooden shacks and few street lights and come to a neighborhood that was not built for them. However, they had beautiful tree-lined boulevards with lovely apartment buildings and these wonderful houses that now they had the opportunity to live in. And of course, that all came after a, a kind of real estate uh, overbuilding, but it was delightful. It was a positive environment. And because of that positive environment that they lived and worked in, or mostly lived, because Harlem is still really pretty much a residential area, it made them feel good about who they were as people and what their abilities are and made them look look to the future and a bright future and to, to be creative. Uh, I'm reading a very good book that uh, we actually showcased in um, Abyssinian Baptist Church, a book called The Power of Pride that was written about 17 people who were a part of this Harlem Renaissance and just the kind of um, uh, detailed facts about where they lived and worked and things that they did makes me really proud of being a part of the revitalization in Harlem now. Um, they um, really highlight some of the areas and some of the buildings that are still there. And I say to my staff all, all the time that we have this wonderful legacy and history in Harlem that if it's preserved and celebrated and made into an active, vibrant community, Harlem again can be a sustainable community that celebrates this heritage and legacy that has been so important to people from all over the world. Just a few things about um, Harlem now. Harlem is not one monolith place. It is a collection of smaller neighborhoods. There's uh, Soha, which is the new in place, and one of our uh, the residents there, Bill Ryan, is here. 
Southern Harlem, or as some people, a uh, person to me today said, well, I live in Soho, I live on 100th Street, I live south of Harlem, so. Uh, but there's the Mount Morris Park area, Morningside, 125th Street, which is the focus of all of the attention here, is just one part of it, and really is a regional shopping center. Um, I often say to people that uh, 125th Street serves more than Harlem in that people from the Bronx, and actually people of African descent from all over the metropolitan area come to 125th Street to find goods and services that they may not have in their own communities, or come to Harlem in general for those kind of things, and to reconnect to the heritage there. There's of course East Harlem, which there's the triangle part where we have the Pathmark supermarket, and then the Spanish part of, of Harlem. Central Harlem South, which is kind of the area below 125th Street, and, is, and an area that I call the heart of Harlem, which is Harlem between the 130s and 140s. And that is the area where, during the Harlem Renaissance, the African American, uh, or the people of African descent, uh, were um, congregated, and a lot of the, the um, facilities or the historical places were in that area, and also the business district was not on 125th Street, but on 135th Street. And Adam Clayton Powell, Jr., who was the, the pastor of the Abyssinian Baptist Church, of which we were where we were initiated from, was responsible for opening up 125th Street for blacks to work and to more freely shop there, as I've learned in, in later years. There's also Hamilton Heights, where I currently live and I just kind of, or Sugar Hill as it was called finally, and I walk down the hill every day to work. And the West Harlem area, Bradhurst, which has gotten a lot of attention, which is an area north of 145th Street. So there is not just a monolith area to say, okay, all of it is booming because it is street by street, block by block. There has been significant change since the mid 80s when I kind of found my way to Harlem. Actually, I was uh, working downtown. Uh, I worked for the Port Authority and uh, for the Urban Development Corporation. But going there again to connect with the community, to volunteer some of my skills, which um, actually my degrees are in landscape architecture, which always shocks people. And, and people say, well, what are you doing in Harlem? There's no landscape there. But it is environmental design, and we can see that the changes that have been happening since the mid-'80s have made a significant impact, but there's much more to do. In the 80s, when I started coming to Harlem and just kind of um, through uh, a political campaign ended up at the Abyssinian Church, I realized the devastation was severe. Abyssinian Church as a landmark to people, and I used to look at it in Ebony magazines to see what Adam Clayton Powell was doing or who was visiting there. But across the street from Abyssinian Baptist Church in 1986, six of seven buildings directly across the street were boarded up. They were owned by the city of New York, as was 60% of all the land in the area north of 110th Street. And I started volunteering, and later, helped the church through one of its committees to form Abyssinian Development Corporation to take a comprehensive look at the redevelopment there. Of course, the church and many others were only looking at housing because the need was so severe. One of the things that I say to people when we look at what's happened now and the commercial boom, as we say, is that there had not been, um, there had been a decrease in the number of people who lived in the, in the area, a serious decrease, because of the conditions of the buildings and people as I say, the success of the civil rights movement and some of the work that even Adam Clayton Powell Jr. did of getting people jobs in city government or in the public utilities were that people were doing better and they followed the American dream. They were able to move to suburban locations, leaving the uh, community um, there devastated or economically distressed, but institutions there that were very strong, like the church, who would not give up and move away. Since that time in the mid-80s, uh, the most significant uh, impact has been the city of New York's decision to turn the buildings around and to, give, to make those available for redevelopment. Initially, it was mostly private developers, but toward the beginning or mid-80s, the community development movement took hold again. And it is the results of at least the 10 years of that redevelopment of that has led to the boom that we have now that everybody sees as miraculous. 
Of course, a lot of the developments that we see from the Pathmark to Harlem, USA, are projects that have been on the drawing boards and in planning stages for at least 20 years. Some of the um, community development organizations of that day were constantly working and battling to get those projects done, but of course, it didn't happen until some new ways of looking at things, new organizations, new intermediaries came to be able to provide money or assistance for that. Um, Harlem Commonwealth Council, which is the, the developer uh, with the, who joined with the private developer to do Harlem USA, is responsible for that project on land that has sat vacant for at least 20 years. The Community Association of East Harlem Triangle was a, basically a housing sponsor led by a very dynamic woman called Alice Cornegay, had been working to bring a supermarket to the East Harlem area around north of 124th Street and just forms a, a triangle with the um, um, East Side Harlem River Drive and I think Park Avenue. But that triangle uh, was the site of over a thousand units of housing that had been sponsored by this group, but there were no services for the community. Abyssinian Development Corporation only became involved with that project at the assist, uh, insistence of the City of New York Economic Development Corporation, the Local Initiative Support Corporation, and uh, at that point, I guess, Chemical Bank, who had been involved in trying to make this project go. And I'm very pleased to say that just on my way up here, I stopped by to drop off my prescription and we'll come back through, pick them up, maybe pick up a few goods, but it's bustling in the middle of the day close to the end of the month, which for most of the large supermarkets in our area is not a time when they have a, a large shopping component because of the, um, the benefits and that people get those closer to the beginning of the month. So when I see that there, I realize the struggle that we've had uh, <coughs> just being involved with it, that project for seven years, but it is something that benefited the neighborhood. There were 200 jobs generated, or 200 or more jobs generated, and 75% of those jobs go to the people who live in that immediate neighborhood. And I talk about that project as much because of Abyssinian Development Corporation's involvement with it and the, I guess, the fame, I'm waiting for the fortune to come as a part of it, but mostly because that signaled to corporate America and the large commercial establishments that it's safe to come in these neighborhoods. When I talked to Harvey Gutman from Pathmark, he often lines out the kind of um, stereotypes that people had in the, in the industry, in the retail industry, of why they wouldn't come to Harlem, and goes down the list to say all of the things that we feared, or other people feared, are not true, and it has not happened here. And Pathmark is doing well at that particular store. But it also signaled that other retailers started looking at Harlem, and now Harlem USA is close to completion it's made a very big impact on the western end of the 125th Street uh, st uh, shopping street, and one that was already vibrant and one of some of the highest retail values in the neighborhood, but it really has made a difference in the neighborhood. And uh, some of our other projects that um, we're going to be working on, or we're working on now, will benefit from this rebirth of 125th Street uh, and the variety that's coming there. Uh, we work as well with existing merchants who are along the avenues in the part that I call the heart of Harlem in the 30s um, in Harlem. But local, locally owned stores, small stores who, as many of the articles and one I think that was, was sent out with your information here, talk about these uh, businesses being put out of business. Well, we find or we feel that because of the interest in 125th Street and having the major uh, chains as they will, or major outlets on 125th Street, people in the neighborhood will stay and, as we call it, shop at home in Harlem. These are people who go great distances to get basic service that a lot of other people take for granted, that maybe you have to go to 96th Street or 86th Street to go to a Gap store. Well, while you're down in that area, you're going to go next door to um, get maybe a, a scar for something else. But if you're in the Harlem area, or if people come to Harlem to shop and to, to really experience the heritage there, there's a more of a chance that they will also patronize these locally, locally, local businesses. And we work with them in giving them loans and, 
and marketing support to help build them up to that strength. The ownership of 125th Street in operation currently has not been a local ownership and operation, but we do hope that some of those stores will, will be there. But as many of us who tried to shop there for years and years, there needs to be the variety and the kind of stores that we go to other neighborhoods for. Let me just uh, give you a little bit more about uh, Abyssinian Development Corporation. As I said, we, um, I came on in 1989 as the first employee. We now have um, about 55 employees that run um, our Head Start Center, our Housing for the Homeless, and we also run a, a, or a, a sponsor for a New Vision School from the Board of Ed. I think you'll see included a list of uh, kind of the things that we've done um, in the 1999, and I have one of our staff people here. We'd be more than happy to talk to you about that, but um, it's really, as a community-based organization, we have uh, seen a lot more interest in what we do because it is important to have the institutional strength and the local uh, partnerships in doing a lot of the uh, projects that we've done. We've done primarily housing. We have over uh, 650 rental units. But in our notion of having a sustainable community, we're now focused on bringing more home ownership into the Harlem neighborhood. The percentage of people who own property or own homes in Harlem is really much lower than any other place in the city. So with the city of New York, uh, we have done um, housing that is, of course, affordable housing, housing with people, for ownership housing with, uh, for people of uh, limited uh, income through limited equity co-ops. We've done condominiums with the New York City Partnership. We also, with the Enterprise Foundation, uh, did city homes, which gave uh, brownstones, sold brownstones to people with incomes of $70,000. We're now doing a homeworks program where uh, there is no income limit, but we found that even since we started this, this program about two years ago, when people were very skeptical about houses selling for 325 to 450 in Harlem, that we have a big rush for those houses, many of whom are, are sold now to my friend Bill, who's sitting here. Um, and the market prices are going even higher. But we do think that with the mixture and the diversity of incomes in Harlem, that the neighborhood can be sustainable. One of the things that, the reason that we don't, uh, I don't admit that the gentrification, um, which is typically where all of one group of people are moved out of a neighborhood and an entirely different group or economic level moves in is because of the work that's been done for the past 10 years of building affordable housing. The community-based organizations in Harlem and the private developers have housing that is um, that has set income levels, particularly those built with the low-income tax credit, that will protect that large um, uh, number of units for people of limited means so that because these these properties were owned by the city of New York and because the city uh, was partner in that development that those houses will not have uh, rents that escalate escalate and move people out that we have been able to stabilize the existing um, uh, population and bring in um, the people who are, who we hope to grow at, at some point into homeowners. And now that we can bring in the gentry to speak, but people who are aware of the cultural heritage of the area and can help us celebrate it, help us improve the schools, improve the, um, the funding for the programs and the hospitals in the area, improve the, the sanitation department pickup by, by being much more vigilant in, um, and feeling empowered to do that. One of the major features of our work is to organize tenant and block associations so that we're not doing things to the people of Harlem or for them, but we're doing them with them so that they get the sense that they can be a part of this transformation. What I found in, in working with my very first block association, we, were, we came uh, to develop on one, West 131st Street and realized that we were putting senior citizens' housing on what was uh, 
in theory, a drive-through drug alley. And we met with the people and said, well, we're going to be your new neighbors and we want to do this development, but we think there's a problem here. And they said, it's not like we don't know there's a problem, but we don't feel that we have the power to change it because all of the powers that be are in the area and nothing changes, but the institutional strength of the Abyssinian Baptist Church, which we brought to bear on that particular condition and bringing the politicians and the police captain uh, allowed us to block off the street so that people could no longer drive through. And we had one of our strongest block associations evolve from that where people were out sweeping the streets with like brooms from their houses because they felt so good about the change that they were able to affect by organizing and coming together as a group. And we've seen that over and over again. So in, in terms of us being a resource to help them be able to rebuild their neighborhood, it's a very important part. Opportunities. There are opportunities for development in uh, Harlem. Um, primarily, the city has done such a good job that there are very few city-owned buildings that are vacant and left in the neighborhood. We are now doing city-owned occupied buildings where we have to relocate people and renovate the buildings. It's very difficult. And the most successful, as many of you have heard about, is the Neighborhood Entrepreneurial Program that just recently won several awards for getting local entrepreneurs who work with community groups to take on some of these, the, the kind of worst properties in our neighborhoods. Uh, however, the partnerships with local uh, institutions are very important. Our partnerships with local uh, developers or using um, locally based contractors and particularly using the local workforce in terms of having people feel a part of that transformation. The, the downsides or the, um, some of the rumors that you hear of that people are being totally displaced, and I don't feel that that's going to happen in our neighborhood. Uh, a lot of the buildings that are, are left and available for development are privately owned. Sometimes we see private owners who are just like sitting on them and waiting to, to cash in on the, and uh, we see some people who put up signs that say this building is privately owned, don't even ask me about, uh, I pay my taxes, so don't bother me. But it, it serves them to uh, non-performing property in terms of their tax liabilities, but it doesn't do a lot for the neighborhood often. Um, some of the projects uh, past the path mark, which as we said, has been um, one project that helped spur the development on um, 125th Street. Abyssinian development is involved in, and one of my proudest moments is that we, with um, six locally, locally owned business people, local business people, have uh, purchased uh, two very historic properties, the Smalls Paradise Building and the Renaissance Ballroom, both of which figured very prominently in the Harlem Renaissance and just people's memory of what Harlem was like when it was in vogue. And we are working uh, very hard to redevelop both of those properties. Um, and um, preservation of the character of the neighborhood and, uh, if possible, the uses of Small's Paradise was really a, uh, the home of a very famous jazz club, but we are trying to retain commercial development on the ground floor and office or institutional uses in this three-story commercial building. The Renaissance Ballroom is the last remaining intact ballroom of the Harlem Renaissance, one where people in the community actually went, unlike Cotton Club, where people from outside the community went. But we are negotiating right now with an operator to make that a wonderful catering hall, and of course we'd love to have the, your club to come up and have lunch in the Renaissance Ballroom when that's done. But it is a very difficult uh, project to do, and particularly when you're looking for compar comparables, that there is no catering hall that, that would even seat or any facility, seat as many as we have here today in Harlem to have a nice luncheon. It's very difficult other than restaurants which actually have to shut down. But the one thing about these projects is that they generate jobs in the community. Catering, food service, training would all be a part of that. And for that we've gotten um, funds from federal, sit city and, and state agencies. That is the value of the not-for-profit development or community-based organizations or our faith-based community organization is that we are able to attract or um, public sector funding uh, so that it can be leveraged um, for private financing. 
And we find now that we have banks and other financial institutions coming to us all the time. Do we have deals? Do you have deals for us? The issue for a not-for-profit developer is our ability to maintain our organization so that we can put together deals that they actually can look at. And having that ability means that we have to go out and raise money and, and find support outside of our community very often. Um, as I try to tell people, as a real estate developer, and people see all the projects that we're doing, and they go, oh, great, Harlem Center is going to be an 800, uh, 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 you know, um, a large project, and you're going to have all that money. And I'm like, well, that's the cost of the project. Getting it to the point of it being developed is a hard part. So we're constantly trying to uh, kind of tell people don't believe the hype in that as a not-for-profit developer, we not only put up a building, but we also have to take care of the people who live there. For instance, some of my first developments, you know, we did these bright, shiny buildings, but we realized that if kids were there after school or during the summer with nothing to do, then our, pro our property v was um, uh, abused because the kids themselves had no place to go or no place to play. So we now we build into open spaces into our developments, as well as, as programs that will provide activities for youth. So those are the things that you just don't get from the, um, the operation of the buildings in which we are constantly seeking support funding from outside the community. So we feel that if we come out and tell people the story of what community development is like, and we're only one of many. There have been, <coughs> their Harlem Congregation for Community Improvement has done miraculous work in the Bradhurst area. Even the Greater Harlem Chamber of Commerce is now doing development of Strivers Center. But many others, uh, Black United Fund of New York, are all part of this transformation that, that you see and hear about. And I invite people to come up. We have a 50 cents tour or a dollar tour where we can show you some of our projects. And often when we show people what we've done, it, you know, like, oh, that's very interesting that we see these buildings. But to get the full effect of it, you must realize that all of the over 125 buildings that we show you or that we've done, all of those buildings were vacant um, and empty just 10 years ago. So there's a dramatic change in what's happening in Harlem, but there is still lots to do. So uh, I invite you to come up. Uh, as Reverend Calvin Butts, uh, the pastor of Abyssinian, often says, we want to make Harlem a part of Manhattan, mm -hmm. that people talk about us and, <laughs> and uh, talk about um, the outer boroughs. But we are a part of Manhattan. And just like we come down to, to uh, events here or going to the village to eat, that we have wonderful restaurants and other um, uh, facilities in Harlem. So I want to thank all of you and to open it up for questions. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, thank you, Karen. Um, if there's any questions, please line up to the left. Uh, keep your questions uh, short and to the point. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Bill Hubbard, is there any demand, or what is, uh, how would you assess the current demand for office space? as opposed to residential, uh, particularly around uh, uh, Park Avenue and 125th Street? Well, I, right now I see most people want to be on 125th Street in terms of um, with the Harlem Center development that I mentioned, it's on the corner of uh, Lenox Avenue and 125th Street, and we propose about 200,000 square feet of uh, commercial office uses there. We've had some interest, but uh, a lot of people are looking for, uh, you know, space right now that's ready. And there is really not a, um, a supply of that kind of office space. But we feel that as, of course, a lot of people are being um, uh, priced out of uh, other areas or areas are turned into more, more of the, the, the buildings downtown are turned into housing, that there will be a demand uh, for that office space. And we've also actually talked to a number of the new internet firms or, or the new startup businesses. And one of the reasons that I think that um, group of people have been targeted, one is because, of course, the access to lower Manhattan or other parts of Manhattan is excellent, better than going to Jersey City or Brooklyn or the Bronx, but also because you have a generation of people who don't have the same stigmas as other people or the fears of about coming past 110th Street. 
uh, a lot of them uh, are talking about coming to Harlem because they see that the impact that it could have, the technology bringing that to the neighborhood could be um, uh, very good. The one thing that, that uh, I'm a little bit concerned about, I know we have the empowerment zone that can give incentives, but I don't think Harlem was outlined in the mayor's new technology plan for technology centers, and I know that the empowerment zone is working to have that happen in our neighborhood. But I do think uh, that it may be uh, three or four years out, but I do think Park Avenue is an excellent place also because you can get on at Grand Central and be there in 10 minutes. That's an excellent uh, place. And, and of course, East Harlem, I find, has a lot more space, uh, buildable space for new developments than Central Harlem. Hi, Georgia Donati. I'd like to know what you're doing, if anything, at this point to um, help the occupants of the area find employment, upgrade their skills, become more computer savvy, that kind of thing to help them get better jobs and better way of life. Um, you could address that. Also, um, are you working on anything to get the community wired for the newer generation, public um, internet accessibility, or anything like that? Okay. The question was about technology and getting the community wide, uh, wired for the new internet technology. Um, Abyssinian Development Corporation was just awarded a $500,000 grant from the Department of Commerce in their uh, NTIA, which is hmm, Neighborhood Technology Initiative. Yeah. Something. Okay. All right. And uh, the, our proposal was to come together with uh, about 12 other community-based organizations from arts organizations to other uh, development organizations like Reedland to help strengthen the outreach for community to get access to the technology. And there are uh, several um, of these groups already have technology centers where they are training people now, but this grant will strengthen that and also uh, bring the technology to some of the other community-based organizations. So our role really is to facilitate more of the nonprofits being able to get the up-to-date technology and then to be able to share it with their users. There is a, um, through our work on this grant, and I must say I'm, I'm not the, the most up on this, and Alicia, you might have to help me. We, there is concern with the entire industry and, of course, the Department of Commerce and others about the digital divide, that uh, as much as the, uh, the economic growth has been the, uh, made a divide between the very rich and the very poor, the whole technology is, is something that is bypassing our communities. Um, there um, have been uh, several grants uh, given to local schools to have them wired for this technology, and even some uh, uh, community groups like the Reedland uh, Center has put com computer technology in the homes of the block association leaders, but to get people used to this whole new technology. And I know that the libraries in Harlem are, are, are one, I've heard several people, they said, oh yeah, well, you know, I gotta go over to the library. And I'm like, the library? Then, yes, that's where I go to access the computer. So that's a wonderful resource as well in our community. But it, it is going to take a much more um, targeted uh, effort. And I really do think that a lot of that is gonna have to come from the private market. I, I think I've seen a lot of statistics where people realize, just as the path marks of the world realize, there's a very large market that is yet untapped, and there is money to be made. And my only thing is that, yes, there is money to be made, but there also needs to be support for um, the community while you're making money and a way to ensure that uh, people are properly trained in the technology of the future so that they can participate, one, in those jobs, as well as other basic, um, what we find is that people need the basic uh, work or job readiness skills more than the technical training of the work itself, but it is just the basic job uh, readiness skills. But I do feel that using technology can speed up the process because um, there are, there's a benefit to uh, and it's, it's almost like a carrot, that it's intriguing for people to, to be trained for jobs in the future versus 
being trained in key punching or something like that. So I think it's a great question. And if any of you have resources or, or links that can be brought to the community, and of course now that we have this network of uh, other groups that we're working with, we'd be more than happy to share those resources. Thank you. Hi, Gail Brewer, and I was just wondering about uh, the issue of job opportunities and training to follow up a little bit on the previous question. Is it perhaps a growth industry in the tourism industry, trying to get people to get off the buses and actually participate in the life of Harlem, or are there, I know there are initiatives, and I was just wondering what they are in addition to what you discussed. The um, uh, empowerment zone, of which uh, uh, covers most of central Harlem and, of course, the Bronx, uh, for the, the upper Manhattan empowerment zone, has designating tourism as one of their focuses for the economic uh, development of the area. And of course, it's something that we have um, been working on for several years in our whole interest in um, preserving the existing buildings. We only have one new construction that we've done in, in terms of housing, but what we've been able to do is maintain the character of a neighborhood pretty much like it was in the 1920s with a lot of the buildings where Ethel Waters lived or other people lived that we can highlight to someone uh, as a, a tourist coming to the neighborhood. We find that there are vast lines of predominantly European tourists coming to the Abyssinian Baptist Church, mainly because there are no other venues for them to experience this uh, African American heritage that they've heard about, uh, read about, experienced in music for years. So they come to the churches because that is a venue that is there, that's stable, that's still up and operating. Uh, but we find that there needs to be more activities that can, as you mentioned, find places for them to shop. There is really nothing that you could buy today that you could go home with and say, well, this was made in Harlem. You might have some t-shirts that were printed or sold by a wholesaler on, in the 20s, but in terms of anything um, that is indigenous to the community. But we are trying to develop the, har the Renaissance Ballroom, not only as a catering hall for the people there, but somewhere where we might have a swing dance night, or that you might have uh, a cotton club review or something, uh, or, or other just uh, uh, music of the era, <laughs> and some way to interpret what was the charm of the area then, and what were some of the, the benefits there. Um, we will have a food service training component as a part of the, the Renaissance Ballroom so that you can hopefully as well generate other restaurants or other venues there. Uh, there are um, a lot of interest in the music of the, the, um, the, the period as well. So a lot of the restaurants and clubs are featuring the music. But um, there's a great opportunity there. Um, it's just how you really, um, how it's developed and to ensure that it is based locally in the community. A lot of the tour groups now are not, but um, we have our small merchants that we want to organize or, or to help them market their services so that when people drive up in the buses, there are places that they know to, to find interesting products and gifts from Harlem. Hello, my name is Audrey Isaacs. Can you please talk a little bit about the empowerment zone and how and what interface there is between what you do and the uh, uh, monies available through the empowerment zone. And also, could you talk about perhaps additional programs that you think would be helpful if developed by either the federal, the state, or the city government? Okay. Um, the uh, empowerment zone, of course, the original legislation was um, created or fostered by our own Congressman Charlie Rangel. So, we are very, have been very much a part of the application process and the, um, the kind of transformation of it from an idea and a proposal to the implementation. Um, initially, uh, I was part of um, our Central Harlem Local Development Corporation assisted in the establishment of uh, a program that was jointly funded by the Small Business Administration to help small businesses uh, grow, and it's called the Business Resource and Investment Service Center, BRISC, and I named it that because people in the community, just like the people uh, felt that they couldn't make a change in, in what their neighborhood, uh, 
people, business people in the community don't feel empowered to go forth and get resources that are out there because they don't feel that they've, you know, been there, done that, or don't feel that it's a timely enough um, process that they can engage in, or don't have the, the skills in terms of translating what um, the, the different factors are from the way they've been running their businesses and the way banks want to look at them. So that was a part of our process, and, and, um, and that particular entity is set up and, and running, and it's been very difficult because you don't have people who have the financial statements and the, the uh, glowing tax returns that you know, their business has grown because, as I often explain to banks, the way that they do what I call business was outside of the main cycle of business in this country. And mainly because they didn't have the banks or other institutions that would fund them. So they created their own system of operating that was outside of that system that now we say, hey, just come in and get a loan. They don't have a financial statement. They don't have tax returns that said they've been making lots of money. If they did, they would not still be in business, um, obviously. But one of the things that we do as a not-for-profit organization are try to work with those businesses to get them to other institutions and to grow them into banks. The overall Empowerment Zone's mission is to create jobs for the people in the community or to create uh, or help fund establishments or businesses, retail businesses or others that can hire the people there. They also have uh, funded several uh, training um, components. Abyssinian Development Corporation is not per se involved in the training aspects, but we feel that with our developments we are generating actually um, places for people to work. Some of the issues with a lot of the training has been you're training people but there has to be a direct link from the training to the actual jobs that are there. And that carrot needs to be there to say that there is a job available if you do X, Y, and Z. The Empowerment Zone, um, in just getting itself um, in terms of setting up an organization and a board, <coughs> might have taken a little bit longer than other places because all of this was a new entity that was set up. But uh, they are considering uh, uh, funding, or we are putting in applications for funding of our Harlem Center project. Uh, the Renaissance Ballroom and the Smalls Paradise Project because they will be economic generators in having these uh, properties developed. Um, but it's very difficult in weighing, bringing people in from the outside as well as to bring these jobs in and then strengthening the existing businesses. So it has been a challenge. I just brought with me the New York Magazine article on their new director, Terry Lane, but we have people with wonderful s business skills from from uh, outside the community, but one of the important parts of that is being able to partner or, or work with existing institutions so that you really can, at the same time, uh, have them to grow as well. Otherwise, it's, um, it is not as um, beneficial to the neighborhood if uh, all the old businesses go out and you bring in, in new, particularly if we're trying to protect or celebrate a cultural legacy. So. I hope that gives an overview of what they do. Hello, my name is Grant Stansbury. Um, I would like to ask if Harlem is, is um, going to focus on entertainment as a way of redeveloping, because um, one of the most exciting projects in our city at this time has been the new 42nd Street, and they had a focus on entertainment. And by doing that, I believe that they were able to attract more tourists. And I believe if Harlem, I wanted to ask if Harlem has um, the vision to do the same. And, and so what, what kind of focus does Harlem have on entertainment at this time? Well, um, other than the, the tourism focus of the empowerment zone would take those kind of things into account. But one of the things that I found in terms of trying to renovate the, the Renaissance Ballroom, it's hard to take an entertainment venue to a bank. They go, sure, right, okay, you're gonna have a nightclub and people are gonna come and drink. Yeah, see you later, go get some great investors. Uh, so, um, and there is a lot of um, uh, excitement that's generated by that. But I actually worked at the Urban Development Corporation kind of in the middle of the 42nd Street 
development. And if you realize the resources that have been put in the development of that project from 20 years ago to now and the amount of public dollars that have gone in to bring uh, the new Amsterdam theater back and to bring back, bring it so that Disney wanted to be on 42nd Street and the amount of uh, funds that went into getting, um, you know, things ready so that this new, and fits and starts as well, that two or three times, you know, people announced these great uh, high-rise office buildings that were going to happen and it fell flat on their face. So Harlem is really very uh, at the beginning of that process and if there were a focus of that kind of, you know, people all the time say, well, when is Harlem going to get their act together? I just, and I'm like, excuse me, um, you know, didn't the same thing happen in other areas or what areas do you know that have one particular leader or one developer who's doing everything there? And it's not unlike that in Harlem, but when you think about all of the resources from city and state and federal agencies that have been put on 42nd Street, if we could have one fourth of that, Harlem could be a bustling entertainment, retail center, and a lot of other things. So it's very uh, slow, and as and I found, of course, you know, coming in, being uh, very young and saying we can do everything right away, that it does take a long time because people deal with the the stereotypes, and I think now that the Apollo is up and moving again, that can be the nucleus for this kind of entertainment center. There's a proposal to do a jazz museum on one, well, in Harlem, I'm not sure it's going to be on 125th Street, but again, to help build on that, that legacy. And if uh, you're in the entertainment industry or uh, no other musicians, we'd like for people to feel that you can grow up and do well and stay in Harlem or come back to Harlem to do that. So glad to have you with us. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is John Ellis. Um, a number of years ago, uh, my architectural firm were the architects for the conversion of the PS 157 school into 73 apartments at uh, 126 um, and St. Nicholas. Um, that project, as far as I know, was the first one to actually introduce a reasonable number of uh, white families within you know, quite a number of years, anyhow. Um, into um, more or less central Harlem. Um, in other parts of the city, we've seen gentrification, uh, where oftentimes um, the influx of whites into the gentrified areas has actually pushed out minorities. Um, and I think a certain amount of that's happening on the Upper West Side uh, right now, uh, on the southern uh, edges. Um, is it, what, what's your feeling uh, uh, about this, about the possible reintegration uh, of Harlem um, or not? Um, is this uh, something, is this desirable? Is it uh, hazards or uh, is it irrelevant? Um, I, that's, that's a hard one. I, I'm, I know the building that-, that uh, I didn't think it would be easy. Okay, <laughs> good, I'm glad. Um, I know the building that you speak of, and I visited about four or five of my uh, friends there, and probably I know that that building as well is a place that has attracted a large, uh, also, um, I didn't, I mean, I know that there are a number of, uh, of whites, a lot of, um, it's a great building, and, but equally, I think it's attracted um, black middle class, some of them are artists, and, and I can't say they're all Wall Street brokers, but it's a great location because it's like uh, a block from the A train and you can be at 42nd Street in 10 minutes. Um, and I don't think anybody, it's bothered anybody. And I do think that um, more, even more than you know, the last year or so, there's been a considerable number of uh, different ethnic groups in our neighborhoods. One of the larger influxes that we've seen, especially with the affordable housing that we've seen, is Hispanic population moving west. But the thing is about um, Harlem and its neighborhoods, it's generally not an issue. It really is pretty irrelevant. Now, as I mentioned before, I don't think that Harlem will ever change from all, from, what is it now, 85% black to predominantly white. 
Um, and I may be wrong and, you know, I'll be one of the people standing there and say, hey, I was wrong. But the main thing is, and what I say to people, you know, my friends who uh, um, say to me, you know, what do you think is it safe for me to move home, that if you recognize the fact that this is a community that will continue to celebrate its African American heritage, and if you want to be a part of that, then, hey, come on. But the people that I target, being from my base, are the people who are the gentry, but they are people who have cultural links to this community who say, you know, my grandparents lived here and then we moved out to Queens and then we moved to Long Island, but I'm, all, I'm interested in this community and I am committed to coming back and serve on your boards, to uh, go to the stores here, to eat at these restaurants, to patronize the doctors, and things that help make the neighborhood sustainable. And so those are the first people that I go to, but uh, like I said, we have 33 houses that we got from the city in the Homeworks program, uh, the, the $300,000 range, and of those, I would say maybe a fourth have gone to <laughs> families where there is a white member in the family. But, it's not an issue for us, and we don't accept the fact that Harlem can be gentrified because of the work that we've done to stabilize and protect affordable housing, and we continue to do affordable housing. It's not that we're just becoming million dollar developers, even though uh, someone was telling me today that the major real estate brokers are moving from downtown. We will still do housing that stabilizes it for affordable housing and and low-income people as well. Thank you. Thank you. We're unfortunately out of time. Before we say goodbye, though, Karen, stay where you are. Um, Sally Goodgold, one of our former chairs, reminded me that a few years ago, the City Club organized a tour of Harlem, and we were hoping with your assistance to do that again. So if anyone here in the audience or listening uh, out there in television land is interested, please contact the City Club. You can do so by checking the credits at the end of this program if you're watching TV. And if not, there's uh, information on the table on the way out. Please join us in thanking Karen Phillips on her program today. It was a wonderful presentation. And I wanted to remind all of you that you've been watching the City Club of New York's Public Policy Forum on the Revitalization of Harlem. Thank you to the National Arts Club for hosting us. Thanks to all of you for joining us, and have a pleasant afternoon.